are, do what is right and not what is easy. And the route is seemingly more important than the destination. Say that again. Be where you are. Be where you are. Do what is right and not what is easy. And the route is seemingly more important than the destination or equally just as important as the destination. These three principles, these three principles are the summation of everything that we have been examining, uh, reviewing and digesting for the past couple of uh, meetings together. And for this particular meeting, I, I wanted our dialogue to be more real. We've had enough Bible. We've had more than enough uh, philosophy. We've had more than enough uh, trying to get to the point or the root of the word and the language and the context within the Bible. We've had more than enough of this. And it just feels like it's time to maybe backtrack in a more practical way or review in a more progressive way so that we can begin to understand and decipher what to do with everything that we have been reviewing. And everything that we have been reviewing, whether it is understanding the definition of Jesus Christ, understanding the context of Jesus Christ, understanding the definition of God, understanding the context of God from both of these uh, terms and phrases within the Bible. Within the Bible, understanding these terms and understanding how they are to be observed, understanding how they are to be placed, understanding the illustration of the living God's chief apostle crucified, understanding what that initial crucifixion means, understanding what the regeneration of that crucified body means, understanding what all of this means for us. It's a lot to uh, take in. And usually when I do give these things, um, or when I do teach these things, the initial reaction is, this is too much. This is too much. <laughs> and for sure, it is too much. And especially in the um, short and brief time that we have together here, um, in other settings, there there's room for more uh, of a proper you know, dissemination of these things. But in this, you know, this brief meeting, this show, Justification, it is about getting to the heart of the matter of what justification means. And in order to do that, you have to understand certain terms. You have to understand the context of those terms. Now, in order to understand those terms and those contexts, we have to revise the um, knowledge that we have. And we have to review the popular theory that we have been trained to believe in the uh, Christian denomination. And so... As a result of all of this and having to restate, to reform, and to refresh this route of going around the issue, then going in the center, then going around the issue, then going in the center, it's a lot. And it is a lot for that very reason, is because there is a lot of misinformation that has been and that we have uh, traditionally and gener generationally have taken to be uh, authentic. And so looking at the Bible and the Bible's authenticity and allowing that authenticity to judge our own. This very, very uh, can be treacherous, but it is quite intriguing and fascinating journey that we have been uh, on is for the purpose of allowing us to understand what justification actually is. And in order to do that, we have to understand the rubbish that exists and we have to have a broom to sweep away that rubbish and that broom is our understanding of terms and context. And once the rubbish is gone, we can then see the room for what it is. And so now we are seeing, and I've been patiently and slowly, slowly and temperately um, guiding this train so that we can see that room in its right, uh, with all of its detail that needs to be seen and in its cleanness and in its clarity and we're still getting there. But at this point in time, it is just fitting to see the room now for what it is. And seeing this room now for what it is, there are a couple of principles that we can apply to our life uh, personally and also devotionally. And so I thought 
um, a more practical approach this time is much is much uh, is much needed because we've gone through the philosophy, we've gone through the doctrine, we've gone through the questioning, we've gone through the answering, uh, we've gone through the fact, we've gone through the fiction, we've gone through the tales, and we've gone through the core, we've gone past the lore, and we've arrived at a paradigm established or a landmark established by the Bible. And so, what does all of this all of this means? Um, understanding the the nature or the the characterization of Jesus Christ and its context from within the Bible. Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, with us is God, seeing what is supposed to be with us, seeing what is God. We can understand that there is more than just observing a personage. There is more than just observing a routine. There is more than just holding to a tradition. There is more than just holding to a theology. The Bible would ha actually have us to slowly and patiently and temperately abandon our theology and to understand what it is saying and what its narrative and landmark is so that we may be able to comprehend adopt exercise and experience it and then live and so from a practical standpoint learning that jesus christ is honestly not a man but according to the bible is a philosophy a philosophy to be applied to the devotional conversations thoughts and feelings knowing from the bible that god is defined as strength and that strength is understood to be wisdom and that wisdom is understood to be counsel and that this counsel is understood to be a philosophy of being we can understand that jesus christ and god one and the same though separate yet still are for our devotional conversations conscience that we may have to our conversation applied to it a philosophy to live and to die by so that going through that experience of growth we may pass through stages of human development along the way. So when we're looking at the Bible from a practical point of view, when we're stepping away from the initial mythology that is attached to it, when we're stepping away from the uh, theory that is attached to it, when we're putting away theos and the ology of theos, when we're seeing Bible context in the narrative of for what it is, we can actually see a practical uh, application calling for our necessary handling and it is for the the good it is for the betterment of our human being and so i began by saying three three definite principles that all of this is supposed to teach and i just want to spend this time going through those principles is that be where you are be where you are do what is right and not what is easy and the route is seemingly or equally just as important as the destination so what is that destination? Um, what is that destination? I just want to limit this this time together with not too much Bible and more just dialogue. So we've done enough. We've done enough Bible. Well, we've done enough Bible, but let's just meditate on these things. It's in the book of Jeremiah 31. And these are verses we have reviewed thus far, and we're just making them more practical. Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34. Jeremiah 31 33 and 34, Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. This is the destination. This is the goal. This is the goal. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all shall know me. The destination is a knowledge of the living God, a personal knowledge of the living God. The destination is a personal knowledge of the living God. That knowing engraved within our heart, our conversation's heart, and our conversation's mind. This is the destination. This is the goal that when it comes down to understanding the illustration of the crucifixion and understanding the definition of Jesus Christ and God, this is the goal. The goal is to know, for all to know the living God. Not having to go here, not having to go there, not go, having to go back where, not having to go in front of there, not going, having to go to pastor so-and-so, not relying on the legend of family, not relying on best friend, not relying on, on, on anything except our personal experience with what is engraved within our heart. This is the goal, to have a living and functioning knowledge of the living God. This is that destination that when we step into the Bible, we are to achieve. And so 
Every destination has a route. Every destination has a route. And so what is that route that is more important or just as equally as important as that destination? In the book of Isaiah 42, Isaiah 42 and verse 16. Isaiah 42 and verse 16, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. So Isaiah 42 and verse 16 is letting us know what that way is or what that route is. That route is an uncomfortable route. That route is the route that is foreign actually to us. That route is the route where it is actually dark, but there's actually light there, but we cannot understand that dark from that light because we've actually, we've actually switched them. How have we switched them? Still continuing with what that route is, Isaiah 29, 13 and 14. Isaiah 29, 13 and 14. Isaiah 29, 13 and 14 reads, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So when it comes to that route, this is what that route is. We don't know the dark from the light because we have switched the two. And to us, what is light is ordering our conversation, ordering our faith, directing our confidence by the precept of men. And of course, we've reviewed what this term men mean by the handwritten uh, pen of priest and minister, ancient and modern. So the Bible would have us not do this. This is the path that we know. We know how to order our steps by what is theorized. Uh, by them that graduate from seminary and by them that are at the pulpit and by them that are uh, preaching or advocating the popular uh, theology in the denomination. And we are abiding by this, whether we are the lay or whether we are quote unquote expert, whether we are pastor, uh, priest or just listener. This is the way that we normally go about um, approaching or proclaiming our faith or confidence in whatever we would proclaim or approach our confidence in, but the Bible's letting us know that this is incorrect. There will come a point in time where it will be overturned. And this wisdom of these wise handwritten priests and ministers, past and present, this wisdom is going to be overturned and it will perish. It will be overturned and it will be and it will perish and a new approach, a new route. This this route is now old, a new route will come about. That new route again in the book of Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14 reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come. And so the route now is a little bit more defined or a lot more defined. Because we're seeing that the redemption that is to occur through the crucifixion is an escape from the precept of men. Again, the redemption that is to occur through the crucifixion is the escape, is illustrating the escape figuratively through the individual's body. That, that crucified body represents the crucifixion of what is handwritten past and present, whether it is theory, whether it is um, principle, whether it is policy, religious in nature, spiritual in form, um, dogma or occult in nature, our conversation is to withdraw from this. This is how this is the this is the wisdom of those wise men. This this form of approach and interaction with uh, the deity, but we need to step away from this and this deity and understand the words and the experience to go along with that and that we may have an overturning of our own conversation as is here given so that we can know what is fact, so that we can know what is fiction, so that we can know our experience and that our experience may not be judged or guided by the mind having their own experience. So this route equally or seemingly just as important as its destination. 
and that's a little tricky to say and that that's and when I do break these things down and I do um get to the point of the deity the deity attached to the wisdom of the wise men and then the the wisdom that is attached to the context and language that is within the Bible there is often a split between the two and we can uh, through analysis see that attached to abiding by the philosophy of the religious law and abiding by the theory of what is handwritten and abiding by the mind and the dictation of the uh, priest and uh, minister ancient and past ancient and present sorry we can see that these are attached to uh, deities pagan deities these are attached this is to pagan deities so we've reviewed plenty of times that the Bible is laced with two forms of approach when it comes to spirituality or when it comes to our devotional conversation. Uh, that first form of approach is approaching the deity through ritual, through sacrifices, through offerings, whether blood or bloodless. Approaching the deity through ritual, through offering, through sacrifices, whether blood or bloodless. This is the, this is the natural way that, quote unquote, God is painted um, in the Bible because this is the traditional scope of the pagan deity. But underneath this scope, the Bible is actually a philosophy educating uh, its careful observer that this manner of approaching the deity is incorrect, it is false, and its approach needs to be broken personally. John 3, 6, that which is of the spirit is spirit, that which is of the flesh is flesh. The division here, we have reviewed there is a division here in philosophy that which is of the devotional conversations body is for that body and what is for the body of the spirit of the mind is for the body of the spirit of the mind and at this point in time the body of the spirit of the mind should hold preference above the body of the conversation and so what this is doing is this is casting down that deity associated with pagan religions and, and offerings and sacrifices and elevating a particular philosophy or wisdom associated with the uplifting of the spirit of the mind. And so when I do explain these things and have time to explain them, there, there's a little bit more clarity to them, but our experience in that route, that route is to take us from honoring the, the deity of, of paganism, of past paganism, whether it is Egyptian, whether it is Canaanite, whether it is Sumerian, whether it is any sort of Roman, Greek, any sort of thing that we can even imagine, Akkadian, all of these deities, um, they honor the same uh, chief deity. We just call them a different name as the times go on. But the Bible would have us not understand this as our source of approach. It would have us understand through the illustration of the crucifixion, the representation of that body being the death of this code and the regeneration of that body being a newness added to that faith and that newness being that which is the spirit is spirit. So that route still, it leads to what is right and to what is not easy because it is, it is, it is definitely easy to honor the ways of old and to believe by sacrifices I am all right, by offerings I am all right, I can believe in the opinion of pastor so-and-so, this theory is decent because it fits my worldview, that's easy. What's difficult uh, what's not so easy, but what is right, is separating from this and honoring your faith the way it ought to be honored. And how ought it to be honored? In the book of Romans 12 in verse 1 and 2. Romans 12 in verse 1 and 2. Romans 12 in verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but... Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is what is right and not what is easy. Giving the body of our faith and the body of our understanding to proving the living God's will. Not the will of theology, not the will of religious theory, not the will of mother and father, not the will of lore, but the will that is held within the context, in the language of the words that are within the Bible, understanding them, getting to know their scope, uh, suffering over them, and proving them uh, consistently to know just what they are and for the transformation of our thoughts and feelings. 
this is what is right. This is not what is easy. And the Bible allows us to understand that this transition that it is asking us uh, to do or to embrace, it is not easy. The Bible wouldn't say, I'm going to make crooked things straight. I'm going to make darkness light if it didn't believe that this was uh, very difficult because what is crooked is us. Us, um, not uh, initially or naturally or physically. Us, always in reference to the Bible's uh, mind, our devotional conversation. What is crooked is our devotional conversation. What is crooked in our co devotional conversation is that we believe through uh, thought on theory, through the execution of deed and act, that we are all right to the uh, deity's mind and eye. Honoring the commandment of priest and minister, following the tradition of what is handwritten, we believe that this is the right way, but it is the crooked way. And so it is the intention to make what is crooked straight, to make what is dark in darkness, which is our conversation and our conversations, thoughts and feelings, light. And so it's really not that easy to step away from a way of doing our tradition that is physical because we are naturally as human beings lazy and we are naturally as human beings uh, prone to physicality and to take power from what is physical and to what can be seen and to what can be felt, touched, smelt, heard, tasted. We take uh, our pride in, in all of this naturalness, but this is not correct according to the route and to the destination that the Bible would have us take and arrive at. And so what's right is allowing the exercising of our conversations, thoughts, and feelings to occur on the words within the scriptures. This is right because we gain a perspective of what they are. We gain a perspective of the, the character of the living God. We get a perspective of our own faith's character. And we begin to rework our imagination of what God is and of what God desires and this, that, and the other to the point where our experience is just real. It is just real. And it is necessarily real for our human being because that's just the thing. All of this that we have been reviewing, all of this is words and philosophy and definitions and Bible and Hebrew and it, it's whatever it is, that's what it is. But there's a point to it. And the point to it is that you are a human being. You are a human being and the words within this book allow you to know that you are a human being. We don't know this because we have been traveling on a traditional tract that takes our humanity from us by robbing us of our conscience and by robbing us of our consciousness and by forcing us, and we, we go along with it, it is not force to us, but it is subtle force through theory, through handwritten commandment, precept, policy, tradition, holy or holiday, baptism, right, ritual, robbing us of our huma humanity and human being well, we're, think, we're thinking we're doing good, but the, in all actuality, the result is that we are not becoming good people. We are not becoming good people. We're not becoming good people because what is within us is not being edified. Our edification is being stripped away through a physical commonality. Because that's another thing that this is for. It is for taking away the respect of mind and for initiating a commonality of community. So where is the individual self and in, in its healing in all of this, and especially when it comes to the mind and the mind within the mind and the essence within our human being? So that the essence within our human being can then guide the essence of our human being. All of this and all of these terms and all of this understanding and, and wisdom that the Bible is giving us is for us to understand that we are a human being and that we have to take back our humanity. We have to take back our humanity and it begins with our mind. It begins with the religious tradition of our mind and breaking down those walls and those barriers of what is and what is not, what ought to be done and what ought to be stayed um, or afraid from or afraid of. And letting these words in the Bible heal and refresh and regenerate the context of our landmine, landmark. It is a landmine that we have entered into, but the landmark, the landmark so that our ground of our paradigm that we can connect to the Bible matches what the ground of the Bible's paradigm is. So when it comes to all of this, it is for understanding that we are human beings and that we have a consciousness and that our faith 
also has a consciousness. And so yet and still, in the book of Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, you're going to see exactly what I just said, but literally just in like two verses. Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Paul is letting us know that we have to put off from our conversation our old approach, our old understanding, our old mind of devotion, and to be renewed in our conversations, thoughts, and feelings. We don't see it, but the war is over our conversation's mind. The war is over our conversation's mind, and the more we give to our conversation's mind, the benefit of a traditional scope, the further our human being gets taken away from us, and the further we are not fulfilling what we are born to fulfill according to the Creator's will for our life. The more that we can understand that our conversation is a battleground, and the more that we can get the scope of our conversation's mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, and behaviors in line with the philosophy within the scriptures, is the more that we can have a renewed understanding of who we are, of what our life is, what our environment is, and our role in it. And this is why that last principle is be where you are. Be where you are. Being where we are, we are where our faith is. And where our faith is, it should be in a place of growth and of development and of exercise. Of growth and of development and of exercise. Being where we are, we are not in another reality. The whole point of this that we have been reviewing thus far. The whole point of justification is to lead us out of a false devotional reality and to guide us, to guide us into a place of being where we are comfortable with our faith and with ourself to the point where we can help another also be comfortable with their faith and with their own self. The delusion that we have and the illusion that we have accepted, the Bible wants us to break it and it can only be broken as we take knowledge of the root, the route, take knowledge of the route that we are to travel on. Taking knowledge of that route, we can you know, understand that destination. The destination will be there, but then it won't be that important. What will be more important is the route of well-being. And the route of well-being and understanding that we need to be where we are. Being where we are, we can accept who we are. We can accept patiently and temporally uh, taking away what needs to be taken away and putting in what needs to be put in so that we can be pleasing, not just to the living God, not just to ourselves, but to the, to the people that are around us. Mm -hmm.